Vinci is London. You will now hear a statement by the Prime Minister. I am speaking to you from the Cabinet Room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British Ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. First World War, it was predicted by military experts that large-scale bombing of the civilian population would be a feature of any future war. This, they predicted, would result in a huge number of casualties. With the threat of war looming in Europe, in 1938, Sir John Anderson, the then Lord Privy Seal, was charged with the task of ensuring the safety of vulnerable civilians, primarily children, within the six cities that had been deemed vulnerable to German bombing. The full evacuation plan was to be known as Operation Pied Piper, the ambitious plan to evacuate 3.5 million children in three days. By the end of August 1939, it became clear that the most concentrated movement of people in British history from British cities would be an imminent reality. Friday the 1st of September 1939 saw the start of Operation Forthwith, the actual movement of an estimated 800,000 children and 100,000 teachers and helpers to safety. Less than originally planned. Labelled like luggage, the children were lined up ready to start their adventure. Within a week, a quarter of the population had new addresses. A tremendous achievement. You used to play in the street. We never had a, a playground or a park near us. We used to play in the, in the street. Because there was only horse and cars about then, there was no cars. <clears throat> and uh, when the war started, of course, we had to shift indoors. We couldn't play out in the street till late. The, the street we lived in, which was Clements Road, we had the general post office um, for Ilford there, and we had, um, on top of the roof, they had the siren and also the ACAT guns. The siren went off and we had a rocket dropped on the hippodrome um, and it was sort of very quick, the sight, they didn't have a chance to do much. My dad was a night watchman, so he wasn't with us. Um, my mum was sitting by the fire with my brother, and I was playing post office across the, a table with my friend from next door. And the rocket dropped, and then we heard the people screaming and from the cottages, that was at the back. Um, we had two windows in the where we, where I was sitting, and in the middle was a gas gas mantle. Um, the windows were smashed. Um, I had a bit of glass in my arm. The table had a, a break across it, but the gas mantle was perfect. Didn't, there's nothing wrong with it at all. The ceiling, my mum was near the fire, the ceiling came down, a bit of the ceiling came down on her back as she protected my brother. And um, the, the ceiling in the hallway had come down. 
and we could hear all the screams of the people. Anyway, some people came in, the um, emergency people came in and they took my sister and I away. We went to some neighbours and um, my brother, which we stayed with mum, of course. And uh, that was, was really terrible for a child, you know, to, to go through that. But the worst thing, I must admit, was hearing all these people shouting and screaming, you know, you, something you don't forget. Well, I don't know what prompted me mum and dad to send me away for evacuation, but all I can remember about that was that we all landed in the school playground and we all had tickets put through our lapel and we was put on the bus and away we went. Um, the next thing I know, we, I was in Bedfordshire, Northampton. of the first operation of the war was never publicly divulged as it was taken from a German folktale about a man who led the children away never to return. Britain declared war on Germany on 3rd of September 1939. In January 1940, following the Phony War, a period that saw no bombs fall on British cities, 60% of the evacuees had been returned to their homes. After the fall of France in June 1940 and the start of the Blitz in September 1940, the children who had returned home or who had not been previously evacuated were evacuated. Um, my father dug out a, a hole in the garden and put a, a shelter up, an Anderson shelter, and covered it all over with uh, earth. Um, so we were sort of semi-buried in the ground and we went down into it. We used to sleep down there. Um, I suppose I was only about six at the time, something like that, five or six. Um, when the war started, I was about five. So uh, he used to go out at night, and my parents and my brother and I used to sleep down in, in, the, in the shelter, in the Anderson shelter. And we got bombed, I suppose, at the height of the Blitz, nearly every night. And uh, I remember one particular night, um, the bombing was very heavy and my father was inside the shelter with us because it was so heavy and he was standing with his foot against the wall and holding on to the door because the door was only wooden, it was thick, thick wooden planks but he was holding on to it to try and hold it in and then when the bombing finished he had to go out. He had a, a tin hat and a stirrup pump. That was his equipment, tin hat and a stirrup pump and a bucket. He used to fill the bucket up with water and then uh, pump it over not a great deal of use against incendiary bombs, but uh, yeah, he, he was out, I suppose, most nights. Um, but this particular night was very heavy and they had lines of incendiaries right down the street. And I remember seeing all the houses burning all the way down the street. All the houses alight, sort of every other house was burned and windows were all blown out and that sort of thing. But we used to love nights like that. In, in a way, because we used to go out in the morning and pick up the shrapnel. And you could pick up tons of shrapnel in the street. And if you got a piece with a German name on, or a German word on the shrapnel, this was gold dust, you know, show it to everybody. It's a collector's thing. I wish I had all that stuff now. All the shrapnel and stuff. Goodness knows what happened to it. I guess it all got thrown away or recycled. And uh, that was significant for me, that uh, that particular air raid because it apparently affected me badly and uh, I, I was very nervous after that and I was sent away then down to my grandfather's at Great Bentley uh, out in the country in Essex um, and that was really the end of my war in, in London and I was uh, evacuated to the country and spent the next three or four years down with my grandfather 
My brother was three years younger than me and he was too young to be sent away, so he had to stay up in London. Um, but it was a, yeah, a trying time. For some children, the threat of impending bombs was enough to ensure that they were evacuated. For others, it took a clear and present danger for their parents to send them away. We were bombed in the house. I was in the house with my mum and dad. It was one of the, I think we called it the doodlebug. And I was in the back garden and saw it coming. The engine stopped and that's when you know something's going to happen. And although my parents had told me always to go in the shelter, I ignored it, all that, and I ran indoors. And we sheltered, all three of us, panic, and behind a chair against the corner of a wall. Um, the next thing I know was waking up and seeing a load of dust and just a glimmer of light. Um, the doodle bug had landed in the house opposite and um, killed all the people in there. My friend was one of them. And someone shouting out, is anyone alive in there? and um, gradually they cleared the way and pulled us all out. From that point onwards, um, my next recollection is being evacuated. So we were obviously evacuated from that situation. Well, I didn't find a life around, but my, my friend had a couple of German tracer bullets and uh, I asked if I could have one. And he said to me, what you got to swap? And I had uh, a 9.5 millimetre projector, hand wound, and a sailor's hat. And I said, I'll give you these. Anyway, we made a swap. And I had it, I had it uh, some time, and uh, I thought to myself, I wonder if I could get that point out. Because somebody told me that there was what they called cordite inside, and I didn't know what that was at the time. So I don't know if you know, at, at the back door, in the back garden, you used to have a square, very thick paving stone, and they used to call that the chopping stone for chopping your wood for the fire. So I sat on the step one day, and I got this trace of bullet, and I'm hitting it with the hammer. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it went off. Bang! All I saw was a white flash. And my mum was sitting in the front room talking to a friend through the window. And I thought the quickest way to tell my mum was to run round to the front garden, because she was sitting at the window, and tell her. As I did, the lady's daughter came in and she saw the blood running and she screamed. My mum thought I hit her and clapped me round the face. So I ran off and I ran round the block and my sister Daisy and my other sister Doris chased me round the block and they saw a man, he'd got out of his van and he was an ALP man, got out of his van and they yelled out, stop him! Of course, he grabbed hold of me and he took me to the hospital because I had it with, it stuck in my shoulder. So that teaches children not to play with bullets. For those that weren't evacuated, they had to rely on the safety of the air raid shelters. If you were lucky enough to have a garden and earned less than five pound per week, you would have been issued one of these the Anderson Shelter, named after Sir John Anderson. To buy, they cost £7, that's around £200 today. But they were effective against all of the smaller bombs, just not a direct hit. If you didn't have a garden, you would have been issued a Morrison Shelter, a large steel heavy box with mesh sides. It could be used as a table during the day and a shelter at night. These were effective for falling debris and shrapnel, and if you didn't have either of these, you would have taken shelter under the stairs or in a cellar or in the London Underground. The, the thing that I can remember most was when 
the council man came round and said to my mum, uh, we're going to deliver an Anderson shelter. And I can remember my mum saying, no, I don't want one. I don't want my garden spoiled. And we never ever had an Anderson shelter. But we was quite friendly with the lady next door and we had a gate between the two gardens. She had an Anderson shelter and it was only her and her boy. And we used to go in her Anderson shelter. Uh, my dad used to stand up in front of the Anderson shelter and listen for the doodle bugs to come over. And he used to turn around and look down and tell us what was happening. Well, we, we were, Prue and I were evacuated after that. And um, we went to a place near Horsham. I can't remember the exact place, but we went to this place near Horsham. And um, we were with um, a husband and wife, and they had two boys. But we still had the sirens going. Well, when the sirens went, um, the family used to go down the shelter, but my sister and I had to stay in the hallway in the house. So my sister borrowed some money off of one of her school friends and said, sent a card, a postcard to my mum, please come and get us. So my mum had a friend who was a taxi driver and so we went home. So that for the rest of the war, we was at home. I can't really remember a lot about it. All I can remember is, uh, we, as I said at the beginning, we used to play in the street. And we wasn't allowed to play in there after six o'clock because the raids, the air raids used to be at certain times. And it was nearly always the same time, you know, within 15, 20 minutes, the sirens would go. So we was allowed out till six o'clock and after that we had to go indoors. <clears throat> and uh, as I said before, we didn't have a shelter. As soon as the air raid, air raid warden went, warning went, uh, they would go in the next door's shelter. I used to go in the next door's house with who had two young girls because they had what they called the table shelter. That was a big steel table with a wire frame around it and we used to sleep underneath there. Um, but one day a doodle bug dropped quite close and uh, my mum said, I wonder if Aunt, Aunt Daisy's okay, because she lived opposite this park, about five minute walk from her. So I ran round after the air raid warning had stopped and we had got the all clear, I ran round to see if Aunt Flo was okay, or Aunt Maud, or see if she was okay. and. There was a block of houses, and the whole block of house fronts blown straight out. And all you could see was the bedrooms and the living rooms. But uh, she was okay, she was further down the road. Because my dad uh, had uh, got the shelter and they painted, painted the shelter inside, because this is what the council said, and threw sawdust against it all so that, um, because of the damp, and our beds, we used to go down every night with our blankets and that, and pillars, and they used to get, like, give you trussles for you to lay on. So, but um, you used to come out in the morning and look around you and to see if there, you know, this was there or that was there. But it was the, the most traumatic thing for me, I suppose, really, was the rocket that dropped on the on the hippodrome, because that was right in our back garden, really, and we could hear all what went on. The majority of evacuees adapted to their new homes quickly and were treated well by their host families. Some evacuees were lucky enough to be sent to family members that lived in safer areas, such as the countryside. However, about 12% of evacuees were treated quite harshly. Many were removed from their host families by parents concerned for their welfare. Bad. Bad, yeah. 
Yes, because most of the places I went to weren't very nice. Um, and most of them seemed to be with old people. The first one, or, or not the nursery one, but the, after the nursery one, that was to an old couple. And my sister was down just a short way away with a younger couple. And then I just gradually went to the older people. And I don't know why. <laughs> um, quite pleasant memories, actually. Um, in retrospect, I realised that um, my mum was treated as a, as a house maid. Uh, we were moved into a rectory, a very large building, very posh, very nice. And the rector and his wife already had um, somebody who did the cooking for them. And we, we my mum and I were put into a sort of um, a room above the kitchen, which had a small doorway leading up a steep flight of stairs, and that was our accommodation. And my mum, I believe, was basically used as a as a server to sort of to tidy up and clean up and that sort of thing, yes. And I was put with an elderly lady in a place in number eight, Yardley Hastings, Bedford. And uh, she was a lovely old girl. Uh, Mrs Gallagher, her name was. And, uh, but unfortunately I was only there for about four weeks and she couldn't look after me. But the lady next door called Mrs Elliot said she would take me in. So I, I moved in the next door to Mrs Elliot. Um, that was when the problem started. Uh, we didn't have any toilets indoors. The toilet was at the bottom of the garden. <clears throat> and I, once I went to bed, I wasn't allowed out. I couldn't go out to the toilet if I wanted to, and I started to wet the bed because of that. I know that a lot of people who were evacuated had good times, but we weren't lucky. I was luckier than many children because I went to my grandfather. I went to somebody I knew because he lived in the country. I'd been down there before on holiday. Um, people didn't seem to have holidays in the same way then maybe it was the war, uh, maybe it was financial circumstances in the 1930s, but we never went on holiday anywhere except to Grandad's. So if we went on holiday, we went and stayed with Grandad in the country for two weeks, and that, that was it. So I've been down there a couple of times, and then uh, I went down there and, and spent the rest of the war with him. My Grandad, during the war, was 65. I can't remember what time in the war he was 65 but during the war he was 65 because we had an army camp um, down in, in Great Bentley um, and he used to go round to the army camp sort of most mornings. My grandfather was uh, a man who went shooting. He did a lot of shooting and he used to go out with his ferrets as well. I used to go out with him with his ferrets and that, that was wonderful going out with the ferrets, rabbiting, and sometimes we'd come back with 12, 15, 20 rabbits. Uh, at, and, and that was fantastic in the war, because he used to skin them, we'd have rabbit pie at home, the others went round to the butchers. So there was meat for people, and uh, he used to do this quite a lot. He also, he also used to shoot pigeons. Uh, I remember helping him set up a hide down in the hedgerow, and uh, he had some clay pigeons which he stuck out in the field and then he'd go and sit in the hide and keep quiet and wait for the pigeons to come down. And uh, so we also had pigeon pie quite often. He kept chickens. He had a, a big garden, big country garden. And uh, I learned a lot while I was down. I, I suppose it changed my whole life being down there. Um, I learned to read while I was down there. My grandfather taught me to read just by reading along with stuff in the newspaper, reading Rupert, Rupert Bear in the, in the Express. And uh, I used to follow that and then I started reading it and getting in front of him. Um, so he taught me to read. I learned a lot about the countryside and I developed a sort of love of the countryside and birds. Learned a lot about birds. I knew all the birds and the bird songs and recognised them all. Used to collect birds' eggs. It's very much frowned upon now, but everyone did it then. All the kids had little boxes with cotton wool in it, 
and they used to keep the bird's eggs which they, they blew out and so I had quite a collection of bird's eggs and I knew about the birds and the nests and used to go for long walks as well. My grandfather was a great one for walking so Sunday, Sunday evening was always the time for a walk. After tea Sunday during the summer you'd go out for a long walk, walk for miles. But I walked for miles with him anyway, you know, with his, with his gun and the dog. And uh, we used to walk across all the fields and uh, all, all the different parts of the, of the village and for miles around. For many children, schooling was disrupted. For others, it was their evacuee years that formed them for later life. Some worked rather than go to school. I think I gained a lot. I think I think it formed me into what I what I became. My interest in in the countryside, my interest in nature, um, my my football really, because he had a we had a huge village green, largest village green in the country, forty one acres. Part of it was dug up. I remember them digging it up and planting potatoes uh, in part of the green. Um, but there were also football pitches and cricket pitches there, and we used to play football and cricket on there all day. I was always out there kicking a ball. It was only a hundred yards away from the house, from the cottage. So I used to go up on the green kicking them. Don't ever remember playing cricket out there. I don't think the grass was quite sort of short enough for cricket, but I do remember football. And I used to have football boots and uh, a football every Christmas. That was my Christmas presents, football boots and a football. Uh, I used to go out and uh, play on the green and that, that sort of interest stayed with me right through my life. Yes, um, there was a local school, it was only a small village, um, two classrooms, I think covered the whole school spectrum um, and we, we, I was, went to one class and had lots of nice experiences in the school. I think the education standard wasn't quite because it was only two classes covering the whole, whole age group um, but it was only for a short period anyway but yes, so uh, yes. I don't know, it's very different in a village school, um, much more intimate, much smaller, um, pulls people in from a much bigger area and you don't do the same sort of things, I don't think. They were quite surprised, um, they made quite a fuss when I took my 11 plus because I was the first person from the village school to get an 11 plus and go to grammar school for some years. And they seemed to think, you know, this was quite the big announcements in assembly at, at the school. Uh, but once I got, once I passed that 11 plus and been accepted for school up in London, I, I came back. Um, we did a lot of different things. I remember going down to the brook. We had a brook that ran a mile or two away, I suppose. And the distances didn't seem to matter then. I seemed to walk miles and miles and miles. But this brook down a couple of miles away, um, we used to go down there and collect clay. And I remember bringing masses of this clay back to school and the teacher was you know, overjoyed and said, oh good. So we made models of the British Isles. And we had a drawing of the British Isles and we put this clay down and this was the Pennines and this was this mountain chain and we had mountains here and mountains there. So we built up a sort of 3D map. Um, not the sort of thing I think you could do in town. Couldn't do that sort of thing in town, but because it was the country and you could get hold of the clay and things. Otherwise, I can't really remember whether there were other changes, but I, I imagine we did much the same sort of English and maths and so on. There didn't seem to be a particular curriculum for living in the country. <laughs> For many evacuees, they were outsiders. They found it difficult to form friendships or were even bullied by the local children. No, I, I quite enjoyed my, my schooling down there. Except I was bullied because I was different. Because I was a London boy and all the others around there were country boys, weren't they? They were all Essex boys, so they, I were different from them. And so there was a certain amount of bullying. I, w I was sort of one out on my own. But I had a lot of friends down there. A lot of friends that I made and I used to go around with the same half dozen people, I suppose. 
most of the time. By the end of 1941, city centres were deemed to be safer, resulting in many evacuees returning home. However, June 1944 saw the first use of the V1 doodlebugs and V2 rockets, which led to a million women, children, elderly and disabled people being evacuated from British cities. Uh, then we was, we was home about, well I don't know, I don't know, something like about three or four months and the raids was getting really, really bad. So we opted off to Scotland. That was fantastic. Uh, the, the most enjoyable part of that was the train ride. It was an old steam train ride, steam train. And uh, I got up and I opened the window and stuck my head out and got something in my eye. And a lady who was in the same carriage sat me on her lap and put her handkerchief up and cleaned me eye out. And I, I can remember that as I was yesterday. The evacuees finally returned home after victory in Europe in May 1945. 